I have uh, been involved in two careers. My first career was teaching, and from teaching, I moved into filmmaking. And in the course of the second career, I've produced over 100 nature films. And nature has done so much for me. I feel that I want to give back as much as I can to defend nature, to fight for the environment. Yeah, I'm going to pause there, and uh, if you want to see the film, you can come later to see it. It's just, uh... And I'll close this for now. So first of all, I want to know a little bit about who are the people that we have in the room. So who's from Thunder Bay? Okay, and uh, how many of you are filmmakers? Storytellers? Okay, um... How many of you, your family's been in Canada for more than 100 years? Okay, and how many of us are um, families of immigrants? Okay. Um, so thinking to origin of story um, and early storytelling, it goes back, if we think about early stories, representation, pictographs, cave drawings, hieroglyphics. I mean, storytelling isn't something new. What's changed is how we tell our stories, and that's why I think it's kind of interesting to follow the other two filmmakers who also talked about storytelling. Um, winters, long dark nights, think about when it was really cold outside, what did people do in the evening? They gathered around a fire and they told stories. And you guys can help me out here. What, usually, what were some of the topics of the stories? Family. Family. What, what might have been things that people would tell around a fire? What kind of stories? Myths and legends. Myths and legends. Battle, we talked about this earlier. Uh, maybe stories of war, um, the history of the... F hunting? Hunting. 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 Yeah, the big fish. The big fish that got away. Or the big moose with the big rack on it. Um, or being attacked by an animal and surviving. Surviving in the bush overnight, survival skills, stories of creation. So storytelling's not new, but the types of stories are kind of evolving. There, I think we're seeing a lot more stories about humanity. We're telling stories about um, being good citizens, being better parents. We're, we still have some of those stories that are about hunting and gathering and how to live with other people. So what we're still seeing in these stories is sometimes there's a bit of a lesson in there. So we use stories as a way to educate and inform, but at the same time, we're entertaining people because if we just said, here's how you do it, and gave people that information and that lesson, it wouldn't really give us much to sit around the fire. It'd be kind of boring after a while, right? If somebody just stood up there and lectured you, right? Part of us coming around and being around that story and talking to those people is we're being ent entertained. They're telling us a story, and a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So our job as storytellers is we're trying to find that beginning, middle, and end and put it into some kind of narrative structure um, because at the end we want people to feel that they're satisfied with that story. Um, earlier speakers have talked a little bit about character, three-dimensional characters. So in choosing our subjects, we're choosing people who are three-dimensional characters and we're trying to paint them or portray them as three-dimensional characters in our stories. And as storytellers, you know, we're, we're telling stories in... Um, the platform of motion picture, but it's no different than telling the story live or telling the story as you're, um, you're writing it in a book, as Meredith's going to talk about her book, Corey, later, and um, thinking about how we're going to engage with our audience. So I guess for me, as a storyteller, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background, um, I have a degree in recreation and leisure studies. I grew up with a, a family. My mother became a filmmaker in her early 60s, and my father... You hear a little bit in the film, you'll learn a little bit more about him, but uh, in his 40s he quit his full-time job as a teacher and principal of an elementary school and he went full-time into filmmaking. So we can change our careers any time in life. That's when I became insane. Yeah. And uh, now that we have this new technology, we have our smartphones, 
lots of people are storytellers. We see that on Facebook, Facebook and YouTube that we can go out there and we can capture and tell stories. So for me, um, I have this degree in recreational leisure studies. Uh, I specialize in interpretation, which in a sense is storytelling, and it's telling it through different mediums. And I grew up with a family that always took me out into nature. And uh, my parents live now in northern Alberta in a log house on a lake. Uh, we have a Finnish history in our family. And every time I go on this walk with my father, because he walks the same circuit all the time, he, I don't know if anyone ever read the book by Aldo Leopold, uh, Sand County Almanac. And in the Sand County Almanac, he writes about um, the changes in the landscape because he, write, he walks the same piece of land all the time and he gets to know it really intimately, which is the relationship my parents both have with this place. They live in northern Alberta, which kind of relates back to the Finnish history because it's a little bit like mini Finland, right? And uh, through walking the land, and he always has, they have different guests, they entertain a lot at their place. Um, he's always teaching us and showing us things on the land because he knows it so well. So because he's walked it every day, he can tell where the bird pooped or the bear pooped or the fox, the, the, the coyote pooped from yesterday because he, well, you, I mean, it's funny, right? But it's true. He points out the poop because the poop is the way you look for where the animals are. You can tell where they are by the signs they leave you. So because he's walked the land yesterday, he knew the poop wasn't there and today it's there. That's part of the story. So each time I go out with him, I would learn something new. Okay, well, my parents, as you know, they're, they're not young people. My father's 86, my mom is 83. That's the right ages, right? That's right. Yeah, okay. And uh, I, know, I know they're not going to be here forever, right? So part of us as storytellers, we talk about sharing history. And I think my parents are pretty cool people. And I always learn something from my father. And I, you know... Because my dad's a little older, I get to tell his story first, and I'm getting the pressure from mom, I got to tell her story next. But I thought, you know, how do I, how do I capture and share their story so when they're no longer here with us, because, you know, they will die at some point, um, how, do I, how do I share that story? Because, you know, I love them, and I like the fact that every time I walk the land with dad, he helps me look at the world in a new way. I bring my point of view to my storytelling. He brings his point of view to his storytelling. We all bring our collective experience. So what I wanted to do is share with the audience um, my father. And so I, I was fortunate enough to get a small arts council grant. And I know for us as filmmakers, one of the biggest challenges, it's not cheap to tell a story for the, for the screen like this, because it's usually not just yourself. It involves other people. And you can only ask so many people to work for free, and this is how we make a living, which is why we sell our DVDs when we go to festivals. And uh, so, you know, the whole idea was that then how do we fund it? So I got a small arts council grant, and then I opened my own pocket, my own bank book, and, and that's how I, how I told the story. Uh, so for me then, to be able to take it to an audience is great, because we want people to hear our stories. And... Um, in the sense of when I wanted to tell the story at first, I thought about telling the story about um, how my father sees the world and walking the land with him through the four seasons. And through the different four seasons, he was going to reflect on his life, his worldview, and also share with us um, his worldview as a filmmaker, um, because he looks at the world quite differently from other people and as a naturalist. What ended up happening is there's always many different layers to your story that you think you set up with one story and then other stories are revealed to you. So the story is also about preparing for death. It's, you know, it's going to happen to all of us at some point. So at this, their point in their life, my parents both are in this mode that they are preparing for death. They're thinking about the legacy they leave behind, um, the legacy they leave with us as a family. And for me, it was really interesting because I, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, you get to ask people questions on camera that you don't usually get to ask people at dinner table conversations. Unless you're me and I dig a lot and pry into people's lives because I'm truly interested in them. But the camera gives you that opportunity. And sometimes when you put the camera on people, they tell you stories that you're not even, you didn't even expect. And I find it... Uh, um, really an honor as a filmmaker, that's the part that I like, is that um, when you give people the opportunity to speak, quite often they reveal something to you that you didn't know, even your own parents. And so I would say, uh, what I've learned in life is make sure that we are recording those stories, whether it be just using the voice memo function on our smartphone. Um, but we also know that when our families go, they take their stories with them, and we can keep on the tradition by the oral storytelling. 
but it also helps because our memories are selective, <laughs> to, to record some of those things because I think we all want to know our history of our story of how we came to Canada and uh, our kids might want to know that history and that story and it's relevant to other people in the world. That's why I like the idea of these web series because we have this kind of online personally curated museum and that's what our stories are, is we're, we're curators of our kind of uh, common history. Let me just check my notes to see what else I want to talk about. Yeah, and I guess storytelling's not new either because we even think about um, children. Children engage in play, and when they engage in play, we think about King of the Castle, we played, I grew up, we played war games, and uh, quite often we play like the Prince and Princess games or doctor games, and it's all about trying to sort out the world and figure out where we are, where we fit in, and what other people think about the world too. And it's a way, way of still, um, through engaging in that story, and it's, we continuously are engaging in it because we're also figuring out our own lives as our roles change as we age, as we you know, become um, students, we learn jobs, we learn how to interact with other people, uh, we become parents, um, become grandparents, and, and we prepare for, <coughs> Um, and a life. And so I think that's why I really like story and why I'm really compelled to other people's stories is it helps me sort out the world because I don't have all the answers and I learn from other people just by asking them about themselves. So uh, I think I'll end there and what I want to do is I'll see, I'm just going to check my website really quick because I did bring DVDs. I wasn't thinking about technology and how a lot of laptops don't have DVD players. I'm just going to see if I've got a clip of Dad's film and if not, you guys can purchase a copy later. Um, I think I have a clip of yours. But with that, so, you know, why do I tell stories? Once again, I picked Dad and, and if you guys get a chance to see the film later, I think it's at, uh, what time is the screening at today? Two. Two. Two o'clock at the at the uh, at the church. So let me do a quick check, and then Dad, if you want to come up, okay. and let me just see what else I have on the. <coughs> so, Dad, are you going to stand? Yeah, I've got a clip here. So perfect. As the great northern boreal forests of Canada, Russia, Scandinavia, and Alaska face an uncertain future, Albert too is running against the clock. Surviving a stroke four years ago heightens the urgency to complete his final film. The Forest is Calling captures the heart of the boreal forests in Alberta and Finland through the lens and experiences of Albert Cartman. I'm going to do a mic swap and put this one on Dad. While well, she's doing that mic swap, being a school administrator, she said, I don't need a mic. But you do because this is for the live broadcast. It's not to amplify your voice. So stand up. Let me pop it on you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being bossy with my dad. Okay, that should work. Excellent. And then keep in mind the camera's there, so step, you need to be closer, you need to be about in here. Oh, and boss me around again. She's huh? a director. <laughs> Her uh, presentation this morning about storytelling reminded me of a story that uh, happened in my childhood at probably about age seven or eight. Mother and dad took us blueberry picking. So, you know, the Finns, they love blueberries, too. And anyway, uh, we went uh, camping and, uh, in the Jack Pine Forest and a huge fire and the story time. And I remember my younger brother telling this story about the black bear and how smart that black bear is. And mom was listening, and then he turned around 
and told in mum, but the karhu oli visas. In Finnish, means, boy, that bear was smart. So, yeah, that's the art of storytelling. And so that's my background from way back in the 19, oh God, yeah, late 30s, early 40s, going blueberry picking. But all my life, I've had the good fortune of living in the forest. And even when we moved to Edmonton and then to Sherwood Park, we lived in the forest and made films about the forest. So I speak as a naturalist more now than even as a filmmaker. We sold our company shares five years ago, and so this film that she showed a clip of is just something we did personally, as far as this calling. But I think that nature is extremely important. In fact, as Albert Einstein said, nature is so important for us that if you look deep into nature, you will understand everything better. Which I thought was pretty tremendous about Albert Einstein, physicist, scientist. And uh, recently I've been watching a new series of nature programs. I don't watch too much television, really, but my wife and I do watch BBC Earth, Love Nature, CBC, CTV, but their Discovery Channel programs that they had years ago. And uh, my pitch to you as a retired filmmaker is that we need to make films. Witness what we just heard this morning. That's why films are important. You bring out issues. But to me, my whole background has been nature. We produced over 120 films, which were on television. And I always said as a teacher, it's fine to do slide presentations, which we did. And we did kits for schools, slide kits. But can you imagine you have a film and you can get it on television? It's not 30 or 40 or 100 or 200 or 500 people, but in the millions. Our programs, you know, sold through distributors to over 100 countries in the world. So I had a good friend of mine who sent me a book one time, Lynch, the great photographer from Calgary, complimentary book, and in it he wrote, for Albert who brings nature to millions. And I think that's the power of film. So I invite young filmmakers, filmmakers to get involved in producing films and try to get them on television. That's not the only way. I mean, there's public audiences such as this that you can do within your communities, which we are doing right now in our community of Athabasca, Boyle, nonprofit groups, seniors groups, hunting groups. Get the message out. The planet Earth needs nature films more than any other time in history. Why? Well, look at the world today. I'm not trying to dwell on the negative. I'm saying there's so much to be done in filmmaking or media, as we know it in terms of what we're doing, is extremely important to raise the issues, as the two filmmakers did this morning. And so in nature, too, we need to talk about global warming. Climate change, there are two, and I'm very optimistic about this, there are two presidents in the world today. They're both not presidents anymore. <laughs> One was Mikhail Gorbachev, who went to the Antarctic at the invitation of Cousteau, and he says that the world we have problems in climate change. Barack Obama said before he left his presidency that we face drought, floods, climate change of all kinds. Now, we can either do something or suffer the consequences. It's not hard to look today that we, we see some of the consequences in the global setting. So as a naturalist, again, I'm saying 
That's the great challenge for you people, the young people. As uh, the president of Norway said at the International Film Festival one day, well, most of us are going to be dead shortly. It's the young people that are going to face the consequences of our lifestyle, of our the ways we treat nature. So that's, that's the pitch. And you know, nature is the most powerful way to try to bring greater awareness. A picture is worth a thousand words. It's still true today as it ever is. And I'm so happy to be able to be talking to a group like this too, the future filmmakers. It's fun. You don't have to be a martyr to make films. <clears throat> I have no formal training in filmmaking, except to watch other people's films. And the best model for me has always been the BBC Earth, or the BBC. I've gone to international conferences and participated in them. But always trying to <clears throat> find the story. Nature is full of stories. And you don't have to necessarily come up with a big structured story. A woodpecker is a woodpecker. Find out all you can about the woodpecker and go ahead and film. And you will be a winner at the end anyway. Because nature is so beautiful and so powerful that it just automatically has people all over the world that are interested in nature. Anyway. Uh, so. There's ways to finance it too. My wife, she's, I was to say, my wife, my daughter's signaling me that I've done enough here. But uh, <clears throat> so, on a positive note, I'm so happy that we have a community such as this in Thunder Bay doing this kind of community thing because I think community is important. Not all, everything in TIFF always, but here in the community, at the grassroots. Thank you.